And hello, everyone. I'm John O'Loughlin. Welcome to McDuff Lives. And it's my privilege and honor this morning to welcome back uh, Anton Chaitkin to our show. Uh, this will be our second interview with uh, Mr. Chaitkin. And uh, on Mondays at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, I've been reading and making a few comments on, on his book, uh, Who We Are, and, uh, you know, so we're starting to get to know a lot about uh, the work of, of Tony Chaitkin, but it's quite a deep subject. And so I'm going to ask Tony to fill us in some more. We, we spoke a little bit before the show, and I, I think if I, had, uh, if I had it to do over again, and I will, I'm going to change the title of the show to, uh, to United States versus Imperialism. Because I think that uh, one of the one of the points that Tony wants to make this morning and is that we've we've forgotten about uh, imperialism and how crucial it is to understand that topic vis-a-vis -vis the American uh, dream, the founding fathers, uh, the American system that we talk about. And so let's uh, let's turn it over to Tony Chaikin for a uh, introduction to uh, the topic of imperialism. Good morning, Tony. Good morning, John. How are you? Just fine. Looking forward to hearing from you once again, my friend. Well, uh, I, we, we're facing a uh, really bad uh, prospect of escalation of the war between NATO and Russia yes. in, in Ukraine and possibly escalating to a world war. Uh, with only destruction as the prospect, unless there's a change, of course. Uh, and for people to understand why this is happening, what it's about, what's the real background to this, we have to know the United States national interest and its history with respect to imperialism, the world system of imperialism, particularly the British Empire. And the all of US politics and national progress in the uh, time from the from the very beginning of our country up until uh, the uh, really the late 1900s, you know, in the 20th century, past the death of Kennedy, all of this history was defined by a struggle between American national interests and imperialism. And what do I mean by imperialism? What is that? What is that system? And how is the U.S. in a contest with it? Henry Carey. Henry Charles Carey, the economist who lived in Philadelphia uh, in the, in the mid-19th century. He, he was the one who uh, defined the program for the new Republican Party that came to power with Abraham Lincoln in the, in the 1860s. And he was a protectionist. He was a nationalist, a very, very progressive man. But he was the greatest analyst of imperialism. Sometimes people in later days think of communists, starting with Lenin, the Soviet revolutionary, as being the people that attack imperialism. But they have only a partial view of it. They don't, communists. In, in, have not understood generally uh, U.S. history and the Western history in the way that the best American leaders have in the past. Uh, so what Carey wrote books in, in the uh, late 1840s through, uh, through the Civil War, and he attacked the British Empire as a world system and also as a system that was, at the time, as before Lincoln came in, controlling the United States through its economy. 
uh, he attacked the British for looting, stealing the resources and the, the very lives of the people in Africa and Asia, Ireland also, but in India. And this means that they would deny those countries the ability to have progress in those countries. They would not allow manufacturing or machinery, modern uh, uh, tools, to come into use in the, the sectors that Britain directly controlled. And indirectly, that was also their policy through economic warfare and other policies in the United States. Now, the way this worked in, uh, in America in the 1850s was a terrible crisis of the farming, uh, especially the plantation slave agriculture. The, the products of the slaves were sent overseas. That was first rice and tobacco, and then it was cotton. And this exhausted the soil. There was no, uh, no industry that they were exchanging with. There wasn't any, any means for them to replenish the soil. There was, and so what was happening is that the, the degradation of the soil in the East drove the slave owners to move their whole operation into Western states at that time in Alabama, Mississippi, Kansas, they were trying to go everywhere. And in, in, in Mexico, that was the spread of slavery to, to other Southern places. This led directly to the Civil War. This is the fight over the expansion of slavery. And this is caused ultimately by the imperial system. Carey proposed instead of that, the original founding ideas of the country, we've discussed this, which is to place industry, modern powerful industry side by side with agriculture and have them both grow together using uh, the discoveries of the mid 19th century like uh, nitrogen based fertilizer and things like this. Uh, recycling, uh, soil uh, protection, but now, be careful with this subject so that you understand the real issues here. How do we define national security right now? We, it's basically defined as protection of our property, not the growth of promotion of new property, new resources, protect our resources, protect uh, our natural resources or protect our infrastructure not develop new infrastructure. There's a great difference here. Maybe you come to understand what I'm talking about as we, as we go a little bit different, uh, further into this. So uh, the imperial system was continued after the uh, independence, political independence of countries in Asia and Africa. And, and, and South America also, where they had been under Spain mostly. And that is, they, they, would, they would export raw materials, a lot of it to Britain, and they would import manufactured goods. So what happened is that whenever the U.S., under great leadership, was able to promote its own industrial and scientific progress, it did so in a fight against imperial interests, against imperial thinking. And there was, they, there grew up in the 19th century an interest, a, a material interest, an economic interest, as we call it, uh, of transatlantic bankers and academics. And th this was. Uh, they gave a counter narrative to the nationalists and they tried to stop the progress of the United States into a great manufacturing power. They were, they were into this 
transatlantic trade and they want they wanted to have the imperial system uh, and the protection of the property of the great wealth interests of the world as the theme rather than a republic generating new wealth and raising the population up to great powers. So these are the two contesting ideas. In the late 19th century, this transatlantic imperial interest, which was becoming the Eastern establishment, uh, more and more excluded from discussion imperialism as a subject for attack or, or even analysis. Uh, starting in, in uh, around 1900 uh, until FDR in the 1930s, th this interest, in, it, really the imperial enemy of the United States had substantial state power, power over our country. Uh, this was true also after the death of Roosevelt until Kennedy, and then after the death of Kennedy. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be going through all this in my, in my second and third volumes of my book. But we have to understand that the United States developed its great uh, advances, not only against this, but in the times when people who, uh, uh, people who uh, uh, fought these guys were in power. Um, for example, the United States worked for the development of Russia. In the 1840s, we built uh, their first railroad. That's in my volume one. In the 1890s, the United States supplied everything for the building of the Russia's transcontinental railroad, just as we had built our own transcontinental railroad earlier. Uh, and then you fast forward to John F. Kennedy. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, he's proposing that the United States and Russia together have a, a, a joint space program. We still have that despite this insane war. And that Kennedy proposed joint nuclear power development for, for progress of the world and for agriculture to use desalination. Now note that the people that promoted this, people like John Quincy Adams and William McKinley and later Kennedy, these are no socialists or communists. Kennedy was a decided anti-communist. What we're talking about is the United States interests. Uh, the followers of Lincoln in the late 19th century were working in, in many ways in a profound fight for the development of Latin America against the Wall Street people who wanted to loot that in company with Britain. Franklin Roosevelt worked for Latin American development during his term in office, and he proposed world progress against the uh, British scheme of keeping the world backward on purpose. Uh, he was really adamant about Africa and other places. Kennedy was trying to champion the Arab and African national uh, independence uh, struggles so that the communists would not be the only people supporting it. He said, where's our revolutionary heritage? We, we, our country came up in a struggle against imperialism. We, that's our, that's, that's how we are. We, we became a power, a separate and, and a powerful country. And that's our national interest. So at the same time as he's proposing working with other countries and, and fairly competing with the communists in terms of influence by helping uh, to develop other countries. He's also developing the United States with dams, with uh, nuclear power, with the space program, things like this. So uh, let's go back again once, once more to this question of protection of property versus the growth of property. Uh, 
some people say that the purpose of the government is to protect property. Now, that's true in one sense. You can't have a civilized society if your private property can just be taken away from you. Absolutely true. But it's not enough. Where does property come from? Where, where, do, where does wealth come from? It comes from the progress of our knowledge and our science and our industry and our skills. You have to have a historic view of this. Otherwise, you're just, you're, you're sort of insane. Like uh, uh, the char character Stooge or uh, uh, Scrooge in, uh, in Dickens. Uh, so uh, right now, we are not increasing our national wealth. We have no, we don't see the, 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 the uh, we don't see national interest in that way. That is our, the people running the government. So when Russia and China get together to challenge the present world system, the globalist system that has applied rules of non-development, no country is now allowed, according to these rules, no country is allowed to raise itself up to become a great power producing power, scientific power. And so Russia and China have challenged that system, which is has its roots, the present Western system that governs lots of the world, including our country. That system has its roots in the historic enemy of the United States the slave owners, the Northeastern financiers who, who attacked uh, programs for our progress. They said we shouldn't have, we shouldn't have industry. We, we shouldn't have, uh, the, like the, those people were critics of, the, of the, the, the Transcontinental Railroad. They were critics of, of the uh, building of industry in the first place. And these are the people setting the policy now. This is the same idea expressed in globalism today. That is the globalism of, uh, of NATO, of the uh, really the European Union, the Davos uh, and other uh, 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 institutions. The IMF as it was changed, it, it didn't, wasn't, didn't, IMF didn't start off as a globalist institution denying progress. It was started by FDR in conjunction with the United Nations to, to help development. After his death, it was changed. So to understand the current struggle where the only thing we produce that is uh, really, really important in world affairs right now is destruction and weapons for destruction. We are calculating on how the US and Britain together can wreck enemy challenges to our system. What's our system? It's the system that is, con that is squeezing the United States and stopping the United States from having a decent life. So this is a great contradiction in world affairs right now. The Russians have some sense of this, but they've played down their knowledge that the United States greatly changed. Sometimes the Russians and the Chinese are guided by leftist ways of framing history, but not always. They, they've often uh, uh, acknowledged and appealed to US history, the better nature, the better angels of the United States. American leaders and both political parties have uh, in, 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 only recently uh, been bothered by people bringing up our heritage, how we became a great power. But this is, this is at the center of world affairs, the question of imperialism. Just restate it. What did the British Empire 
there are other empires too, but let's just concentrate on Britain. What did they do in Africa and India? Leave Ireland alone for a minute. They, they went in there and they brought out raw materials, minerals, gold. They also kidnapped people. That's the slave trade. They brought out opium from India. They stopped, they converted the agriculture to, from food to, to uh, uh, opium production. Uh, they, and they, they stopped the native industries in those countries, India and Africa. India was larger than just what we see as India today. And they, they prohibited in many different ways the introduction of modern machinery and skilled work into those countries. They might work in some factories, but that's only at the lowest level. And they were not allowed to have scientific power in those countries, even though those countries, had, a country like India was the, was the source of the world civilization in so many ways, science. So this is the, 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 um, the definition of imperialism. And Henry Carey uh, and Lincoln was very much grounded in this, uh, as was FDR and Kennedy. Imperialism is the system that deliberately prevents the industrial and scientific and agricultural progress of the world. If the United States identifies itself with that system, even though it isn't called imperialism, then we are headed for suicide and the world is in, in, in grave danger. That's, that's what's behind the current world danger right now. You know, as I read your book and think about what you're saying this morning, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that the pendulum's going to swing back to, towards national sovereignty. Um, it seems that through our history, we've had uh, various periods when it was... Uh, it was happening the way you say it should happen. And then it would just, somebody would put the brakes on and it would stop for a while, like like with uh, Andrew Jackson, for instance. Um, and then you have uh, uh, an FDR who really came out of that patrician uh, New England uh, wasp tradition in the first place. But as you say, he was a great leader and he took took on the imp imperial tradition and pushed it aside in the, in the name of progress for America. And I think it's important that we, we keep in mind that progress for America does mean progress for mankind. It just, it just that we have to, to be the, the forge. We have to make the, the progress here and then other people, if they choose to, can, 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 uh, can take advantage of the system but make it in their own ways but is there right now i mean i would put it in a nutshell the the people on the left would tell you if you're not with them then you are a fascist mm -hmm. and the people on the right would tell you if you're not with them then you're a communist but where is the fat, where is the nationalist? Where are the people that say, I want my sovereignty back? Uh, you're uh, one of the most important voices, as far as I can tell, in raising this issue. Uh, what hope do you see for the pendulum swinging back towards the national sovereignty ideals that you've been uh, promoting? Maybe we should look at Kennedy a little closer. Uh, he was the gr last... Uh, really uh, outstanding uh, nationalist uh, president. Uh, and, and, and we're not talking about chauvinism. We're not talking about America uh, as a bully or America as just looking out for itself. It's, it's America's interest as a benefit to the world. So Kennedy, um, 
first of all, the Cuban Missile Crisis happened 60 years ago this month, I believe, October mm -hmm. uh, 1962. And in that crisis, Kennedy did something that people today really have to do if they are concerned with the future. He uh, acted, yes, he was president, but people could act this way who might promote a new presidency. He acted uh, on his own, taking responsibility to uh, go a different course than was uh, urged by people in authority beside himself, people in the military and intelligence who, were, who had more uh, uh, experience in military and intelligence affairs than he did, uh, but were wrong. That he understood they were wrong. Uh, he also took it upon himself to look into and, and recommitted himself constantly, look into what is the right course to take to get us out of this confrontation with the Soviet Union. They had put missiles in Cuba. We had missiles in, uh, or NATO had missiles in Turkey right on the Russian border. But how are we gonna get out of this uh, without blowing up the world? So he took it upon himself to not just to go against the opinion of wrong authorities, but to make sure that what he was doing was right and was gonna, gonna have the result of saving uh, the, the, the world and not having uh, Armageddon. So this idea of uh, differing from established opinion, when Kennedy was able to assure himself that the leaders of that established opinion, in his, in his case, it was uh, Pentagon leaders in the faction, uh, this transatlantic Anglo-American faction, Lyman Lemnitzer was the chief guy there, uh, and Alan Dulles at the CIA. He, he, Kennedy assured himself by rigorous thinking and, and with the, working with the people he trusted, including his brother, that these people were insane. They were only concerned about the interests of this pro-imperial power not the United States or not the human race. That's insanity, complete insanity, especially when you're faced with nuclear war. So his own background, you, you mentioned that he came out of the New England WASP background, not exactly, right? Right. He's a Catholic and his one part of his family came from Irish rebels uh, going back in Ireland all the way back to the 1790s in the rebellion of 1798. He, he was very uh, taken by that background. His grandfather was the mayor of Boston, was really into this stuff. Uh, but also he, he was a deep student of American history. Uh, he, he studied the American Revolution and the, the uh, uh, also the, the how Britain got into supporting Hitler and the better people within Britain who broke from that. His father was ambassador to England and he was, he, he grew, John Kennedy grew up with a, an insider's knowledge to a certain extent of what was going on between the, uh, the bankers, aristocrats of Britain Wall Street and so forth. His father was was had a wretched, uh, pro really pro aristocratic Britain and pro fascist at the same time. He also hated the British, and so his father was a very conflicted man. And John Kennedy grew up 
and and with his own studying and his own uh, uh, struggle to understand things as a congressman, and his own experience in World War II, uh, as a as a uh, pretty heroic uh, naval officer, he he was able to form his own thinking about the mission of the United States in the world, and he saw that the uh, that what Roosevelt stood for had been betrayed by this gang that were really on the enemy side in World War II or in the buildup to World War II in particular. Then they took over again after, this is the Dulles faction. So Kennedy rose to power against them. He As a senator, he opposed them. Um, so what, how do we, how do we, what's the hope now? As you, as you indicated, uh, there there has to be some recognition among activists and concerned people in the United States that what most people are involved in in politics is sort of like a a little imagine a, a one foot wide square like a boxing ring, right? And on that one foot wide square are little two inch tall people and they're fighting it out. And one of them is the Trump people and the other one is the anti-Trump people. And the anti-Trump people uh, are promoting various types of cultural degradation and war with Russia, et cetera, et cetera. And the Trump people, I'm talking about what's wrong with what they're doing, but they don't see any of this. The Trump people uh, say that we've got to we, we, we got to fight on the issue of uh, we don't like vaccinations and uh, we, we there, there wasn't really an election in 2020 and things like that. And, and it's these are two inch tall people. And here's the world threatened with annihilation. People have to have to grasp how dangerous current U.S. politics is. The folly involved on both sides in this partisan, uh, you know, contempt and attempts at censorship and uh, and and uh, so forth. No solutions to anything are proposed. You have to be able to to hope, and we we there there is a whole body of of uh, 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 I think pretty accurate and courageous writers and and uh, internet people and people having uh, uh, trying to poke holes in this who are criticizing the the war. Uh, recently, uh, the Pope and Elon Musk, both of whom are really, in, in a sense, globalists, even transhumanist uh, Musk, right? But nevertheless, they, they said, well, wait, maybe it's not a good idea for us all to be exterminated. Maybe that's not a, a, a good, a, a viable proposal. That's where this is headed. There's really no answer to what I'm saying by either most Trump supporters or, or particularly by the Democrats. They, they have no answer for this. They're, it's simply not, it, it, any discussion is excluded. And that's not, my hope is that that is so, so dangerous. The current two inch tall fighting it out in politics is so dangerous to humanity by excluding looking at the need for peace between the major powers. It's so dangerous that logically people will come out and say, let's 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 have a plan to, to back off this, this confrontation. Let's relook 
at the interests of the United States and, and the rest of the world. We're not, we're not building ourselves up. We're not building much of anything. Our main product is destruction right now. Sanctions, war materials, and so forth. So it's just reality that is impinging on this little boxing ring, this insane little two inch tall boxing ring that is called US politics. The interests of the world have to go forward and, and by blowing up the bridge from the mainland to the you know Crimea, and then Russia retaliating by blowing up the infrastructure of Ukraine. And now we're gonna escalate some more. Is that really a good idea? Where does that end? How about building infrastructure instead of blowing it up? Well, you know, I agree with you, right? But I do have a question about this mutually assured destruction as a uh, as something that should motivate us to you know, go out and say, stop the war and, and uh, you know, beat your swords into plowshares. If the people in Ukraine aren't worried about nuclear war, then why should we be? The people in Poland, they're not worried about it. The people in Belarus, I don't know what they have to say. I don't hear much from them. But all along Eastern Europe, the the... Talk about mutually assured destruction. We, both sides will assure the destruction of every single uh, living being uh, along the border of the former Soviet Union. Um, I think there's got to be something else besides the fear of mutually assured destruction to to motivate people to to stop this war. And and there's where I think. We have to attack the idea of uh, eugenics because the people that are willing to let these wars happen are likely the same people that are uh, behind the scenes um, promoters of eugenics that have been in business for over 100 years. The whole uh, story of the uh, uh, Cold Spring Harbor and uh, the, the attempt to um to just to well like the nazis for goodness sakes the the idea of exterminating the lesser lesser valuable people lesser races uh and uh you know with along with that uh let the old people just die off in 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 other words sure i want everybody to to be in favor of building uh, better humanity for everybody. Um, I'm not worried about 8 billion or 10 billion people. I think we've got plenty of room. But the ones that hold the purse strings, the ones that run these, these uh, schemes, they would not mind a bit to see uh, 7 or 8 billion people disappear. So that, what, what's your opinion of, of, of the eugenics uh, idea as it developed over the 20th century? And where are we now with that? I mean, you could take a, you could analyze the deficit and the negative uh, uh, thinking. Uh, you sort of get into a, a, a never-ending spiral downward with it. I mean, the, the Germans, the Nazis had uh, killing centers in Poland. Yeah. And in and really in in other places, Ukraine and stuff, but that besides the concentration camps, and they were not primarily inside Germany, and so the German people, you could say, didn't see this. Maybe that was willful. They also saw a lot of their cities being bombed during the war. So they, 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 what do the Americans, what do American people see in all the theaters of war all over the world? We don't, people don't see it. They don't, they also don't see the, the opposite. They don't see the progress that we had in the past. Um, as for eugenics, yeah, 
uh, I've I've worked on that. We, you, you've read things that I've written, and and other people have have done. I'm I'm a little bit of an expert on the development of eugenics uh, by this transatlantic imperial faction in the United States and in Britain. Uh, also by the the Geneva faction in, in French speaking Europe uh, in Amsterdam, but. Um, you have to, in order to uh, get a, a fresh sense that allows you optimism and courage, you have to breathe deeply and take up the topics that our fathers and grandfathers were interested in, which is engineering and scientific agriculture and the space program and electricity and its benefits for the world, things like this. Um, I recently had a discussion with a, a guy from East Africa and we were talking about some of these same issues and he said that he became a civil engineer. He's, I think he was from, uh, maybe, forget what an East African country. So he said that he became a civil engineer because that is what his country needed, but also it was the only interesting and exciting thing and way of him for him to contribute to the world, not politics. Uh, but that's, that's a sane view. So if you, you have to start even if this is not, it doesn't directly respond to the evil. In a sense, you can't directly respond to them because they are not, uh, there, there's no, th these two sides are not commensurate. If you know that, that term from science or from geometry, one side is interested in building things the other side is interested in stopping the first side. Yes. So it's not, but it's not, it, 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 the interest in building things is not really against somebody else. Whereas the other side defines the whole thing as preventing people from doing things and having power over them. So on our side, the, 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 the beginning of I believe political wisdom and strength and courage is excitement and knowledge and inquiry and questions asks about the real needs of mankind and how to solve them. You have to start with that. You have to look, for one thing, you have to look at suffering humanity and say, how are we going to solve these problems? We have problems of water, fresh water. We have problems of starvation from famine or dislocation, but also from lack of development. We have this in many parts of the world. We have problems of unemployment or misemployment. We have problems of, uh, uh, of uh, part of this is, of course, the, the need for, for stability and peace. But let's start with looking at where we are as a human race in our capability of solving problems. You know, I, in, the, um, in the book that I'm writing now, uh, the uh, second volume, I have a, a, a long chapter that I'm writing right now on, on agricultural reform. And uh, one of the great breakthroughs in science at the time, in the 1830s and 40s and 50s, was around a, a German scientist named Eustus Liebig, L-I-E-B-I-G. He, he, he was the great uh, father of agricultural chemistry and a lot of organic chemistry. And he was looking at the minerals that are in the soil and that need to be replenished in the soil and nitrogen that comes largely from the air for plants, but you can make nitrogen-based fertilizers, artificial from, from 
inorganic materials. It's not just recycling cow dung and things like that. So um, in this, uh, there was a, a, an intense discussion about agricultural reform because our ability to grow crops was failing in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. People were being driven away from the East Coast, not just the Southerners. And so this is a really intense debate. And the, the, the scientific solution for this was to understand that the soil was not simply a treasure house that has, uh, you know, the, is, like it, it's a resource and you use it up and you have to go away. It depends, the soil depends entirely on uh, how it's, it's, it's used and developed. You, you, you have to add nutrients to it. You have to add minerals to it. You have to add, uh, you have to take care of it in a way that increases its produ productive potential. If you go all the way to our present time with this idea, we don't even need soil to produce food and crops. In, in Holland, the Netherlands today, they have soilless agriculture. They produce, uh, they have massive uh, in, and intensive facilities for uh, uh, growing food and crops without soil. And uh, they, it uses less water, and it 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 uh, is a it's a really exciting potential. I don't say that you want to do all that. That's the replacement for farmers and for regular agriculture. One, but but it 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 gives you the principle of this that we have the a really exciting capability of producing a, a high standard of living for mankind. What's what's holding one of the things you can see right there, what's holding this back? Amsterdam, Holland is one of the historic centers for the evil imperial system. It was the Anglo-Dutch imperial system. They were the uh, they were bankers, they were Calvinists using religion to deny uh, the progress of mankind, saying that God made people poor and rich. So in Holland today, some of these uh, corporate and banking interests have control of this technology and deny it for use outside of Holland. That's a pretty big theme in agriculture, isn't it? In, in for cartels uh, and, and huge corporations. Uh, and people say, well, didn't they, didn't those corporations give us progress? No, the progress came from the advancement of science and industry. Often there were big corporations that were formed, but not by people like that, not by bankers. They never formed anything that, that, that advanced science. Uh, uh, people like Rockefeller and Morgan in our country took over industries that others had built and that the nation had built, railroads that were built by uh, patriotic industrialists and by the government. Same thing in the oil industry, everything. So the, the excitement of being able to fulfill human needs, not by just some sort of, uh, 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 you know, let's cry for the poor or something like that. Let's be romantic or let's be, uh, have our head in the clouds. We, no, this is really hard realism. The most realistic people in the world are those who solve problems by engineering and science. They're the, they are the realists. The human race does not survive without them. There is no human race. It, that defines the human race all the way from the invention of agriculture. So there is where this future comes from. It's by defining the needs of people. China's Belt and Road program in, uh, you know, 100 countries to build infrastructure, to build power plants, to help with agriculture, to help with a lot of things all over Asia, Asia and Africa into Europe 
That's the kind of thing the U.S. should be doing. But that's that's the a, a major uh, for in the forefront of of this tr trying to devote our thinking and our and our resources to solving problems. What does that say about the chi Chinese form of government? I don't know. I don't think, in, in a sense, that's not the issue. I think our constitution is better. I like our constitution. I like our, our form of government, the theory of it in particular. But the, the, re the realists are the guardians of mankind's existence. And that's the engineers and scientists. Those are the realists. And I, by scientists and engineers, I'm not talking about people who are who are in, in Dr. Strangelove blowing up the world. I'm talking about the people who have really until uh, the last few decades have been the builders of the USA and the helpers to build other countries. That's where that's where the sentiment and the ideas for peace are going to come from. That's the realism that we need. You, that's above this two inch tall business. I mean, you can, uh, we've discussed this before, but you can see that with relation to Latin America. Uh, in the past, Americans who were sensible and sane and I exclude Wall Street from that, were interested in the progress of Mexico and uh, South America and, and uh, the whole region together. McKinley had a, was worked with American army engineers and Southern, South American people to build up um, a plan for building a huge railroad network throughout all of the Americas, North and South. And that's what he was involved in. There was a great map online. You can get this. When he was murdered and Teddy Roosevelt took over and, and just changed the agenda. Uh, the Panama Canal was a triumph of engineering, but not of this impulse, because it was done against South America instead of in cooperation, as we had earlier thought. But the, the excitement about developing uh, the, these countries in, co in coordination with our own, not not just having people, you know, grow bananas and coffee and send them up here, and then we we let them uh, uh, be controlled by drug gangsters and and so forth. That's not realistic. Look what look what it's gotten us: a surge of refugees from chaos and poverty. Is that realistic? The engineering the cooperation and the scientific progress that would turn those areas into tremendously productive places. The sun shines. That's a great thing. And, and you can grow things and you can, and you have people uh, who you have, have peoples who have a, uh, you know, a, a, an ancient history of being city builders and astronomers. That's realism. It, the present policy by the Republicans to uh, stop the migrants at the border and by the Democrats to have them come over. That's this little two inch tall thing. You get what I'm saying? This is, this is completely unrealistic. There's no, there's no stopping the migrants at the border and there's no letting them over. Either one is, is, is a disaster. The solution is a different point of view. It starts with this excitement over the uh, the our the pride and excitement of people who who uh, devise new ways of solving problems. The engineers, the, the soil scientists, the uh, the builders of irrigation, great irrigation projects, the people who uh, uh, can can uh, devise ways of Putting together, we had this back in the 1980s with President uh, L Jose Lopez Portillo. Worked with Lyndon LaRouche for a while, 1982, 
uh, and they were talking about building uh, nuclear power plants in Mexico and developing agriculture. But the, behind that was our former generation in the USA of engineers and scientists, particularly people who were so uh, progress uh, minded. Kennedy had a wonderful leader of nuclear science, uh, Seaborg. I think that's his name, Glenn Seaborg, uh, atomic energy commissioner, if I remember. I, 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 you know, I have to look this back up again when I get to the chapter, but he, he is, he's a fantastic scientist, discovered elements, and he's, he's promoting the most powerful progress in uh, nuclear and chemical processes for the benefit of our country and mankind. Uh, and uh, including nuclear desalination. But you have, to, you have to intercept people's excitement. Also young people uh, stepping back from just being pessimistic about, you know, I know I, I have liberal and conservative friends who are morons. Well, you know, they're also good people. But let's get a fresh let's get some fresh uh, insight into this. If you start if, if fresh, fresh blood uh young people throughout history have always been excited about being invited so to speak to participate in in a great uh project for for uh, building up uh uh solving solving human needs for for particularly in engineering and science sometimes in other fields like diplomacy but but particularly in in technical development and this excitement should be offered again and should we should be thinking about this as peace this is where in the 19 up through the 1960s peace and development development meaning intensive progress in in man's powers to produce and to solve terrible problems like disease and hunger and so forth with exciting new powers. Peace and progress of that sort have always gone together. And we had that idea up through the 1960s and then, then it was thrown away. We don't have that generation of this kind of civil engineering. Who's going to build the infrastructure in the United States that we need? We have to recover this, this idea, but right now to get some idea of what, what's behind this insane conflict with Russia and China, you have to get back to this excitement that we formerly had about solving problems of man and nature in, in a way that gives us a great future. That's the... That optimistic excitement, particularly of young people entering the field or parents or grandparents hoping their children will do something useful in the world and excited that with their uh, prospects, that kind of thinking has to, has to be the impetus where we, we say we have a common interest with these other countries whose governments have or recently we have defined as enemies. Put that aside right now. We we should be powerful enough to defend ourselves. I mean, uh, we we don't want to get less powerful, but we are. We're getting less powerful. The more weapons we produce, the less power we have to define and control world events. It's spinning out of control. So the power of our country comes from this kind of excitement over progress, our own and and mankind's progress. That's how you get. I can't be any more specific because this is an idea, but it's the idea that it is behind America's mission in, in the world and America's uh, 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 whole history from the side of the American patriots. That excitement over improvement is the secret background of the US of A. Without that, well, there's no way out of this crisis. In the passion for improvement, and that's a material improvement. 
it means that if you are if you have depression about there's no way to have a future whether you're a warmonger or you just fear that warmongers are going to blow us all up or whether you're a, an environmentalist who is filled with doom because of global warming or something else just put that aside for a minute look at mankind's needs and see how you can have a sane development of human powers to solve problems uh, and not degrade the environment and not get into a war. But the excitement comes from this passion for improvement. That's, that's where you have to get the idea of peace from. Peace is not going to be, is not going to come from just responding to evil. They're not talking about what's going on. So if you respond to them by talking about how evil they are or by studying how they came to be so evil, you don't get too far unless you're starting with the people that they opposed who were progressive, who were for improvement. It, this is not an easy subject, but the, the, the answer to eugenics is to improve the way and euthanasia and, and, and you know, Malthusianism. The answer to that is improving the ways that a, a, a growing population can be supported, particularly a population of young people, can be supported in the world and be healthy and have really good prospects for the future. How can we do that? And what does what do some of these technologies like space travel and uh, nuclear and fusion and and uh, other things what how does that fit in? Those are things that we can cooperate with others on, but there's no way out of this by simply looking at our interests versus Russia's interests or China's interests. What interests? We're talking about securing our property, but we're not producing property holding on to something that's melting away. You have to build. So that's that's my answer to this. It's it, it this this involves that's why I'm writing about the history of this side of things. This exciting fight for universal progress in American history. It is exciting. It's an exciting book to read. Uh, as I read it on Mondays, I find people getting very, very intrigued with it and uh, uh, one, looking forward to the next uh, installment. So I'm looking forward to reading that next Monday at 11. And uh, uh, so many things I'd like to keep talking about, but we've expired our hour already. And uh, so we're going to leave it there for today. Um, yeah. I wish that there was a way that I could just like like pulling back a blanket off of off of uh, all the, all the good things that you've just mentioned because it it seems like we're there we, we we are those people we are those engineers and and our young people do have just like I did as a young person that desire to make things better to learn how to do things better and to help other people and but there's such a dark blankets been been cast over us right now and that's that's kind of what i've been trying to do is to unpack things like henry kissinger and nssm 200 that have destroyed our food supply and all of these things that hopefully what you have is still there what you're offering is 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 a uh, a pilot light that needs to just come into its to, to full bloom uh the heart the hope and the utility of the of the incredible uh, intelligence of people as they are coming out of school and going into life to make a choice to to try to make things better um very optimistic and uh i i hope uh a voice that will be heard uh tony chaikin thank you today thanks a lot john all right we'll be back again soon with tony and uh, i look forward to seeing you all tomorrow night with uh, David Underdown at 8 p.m. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you again.